Hi there, and welcome to this episode six in the Rethinking the Human Factor podcast with me, your host, Bruce Hallis, here at Marmalade Box. Today's a great day. Uh, today's the day that I get to talk to somebody who has had a significant influence on the size of my bookshelf based upon the number of books of theirs that I have bought and the amount of time I've had to spend reading and creating uh, large amounts of notes in terms of the work I'm doing around researching the human factor and developing the SABAC framework for awareness, behavior, and culture. And also somebody that I have um, spent some time watching, uh, watching online in terms of talks that they give, videos they do, to help me get to better grips with the challenge uh, and opportunities that culture gives us when it comes to influencing behavior, potentially around information security. So, Who is our guest today then? Well, our guest today is a gentleman by the name of Hurt Jan Hofstede. Now, for those of you who've been involved in marketing, whether from an academic studying perspective or from uh, industry practice, or maybe those of you who as large or focused in the area of culture, even maybe some of the people that I've met who have come from a learning development background, the name Hofstede is probably gonna ring a bell. So our guest's father, back in the 1970s, did a piece of research whilst at IBM looking at culture across the organization. And this piece of research has gone on to be the foundations upon which a lot of the current thinking around national and organizational culture is based. They are probably, as a father and son team, one of the most routinely quoted specialists in the area of national and organizational culture and they have written many many books so i was really taken back but incredibly happy when i reached out to fertian that he was really happy to have a chat around culture and to maybe put some ideas around in terms of how that might be of relevance to the community here at the Rethinking the Human Factor podcast and more generally the information security industry. So without further ado, here is Gert-Jan Hofstede. Gert Jan, um, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on uh, the uh, on the show. I'm really grateful that you've spared uh, a little bit of your time to talk to us about uh, organizational culture and culture generally. And what I'm hoping is that our listeners are going to take away maybe four or five key points for them to, to go away and have a look at. And also what we'll do, we'll um, in the show notes, we'll show them how they can get in contact with you via the website in terms of the information and your ideas. So um, it would be great if you could just maybe introduce yourself because you know in the information security industry, I don't think a lot of people are going to know who you are, but hopefully by the end of this podcast, they're going to have a much better idea. But it'd be great if they could get an understanding of, you know, why you're such a well-known and respected specialist when it comes to national and organizational culture. So maybe you could tell us a little bit of your journey, uh, who you are. Yes. Uh, My name is Gert-Jan Hofstede, and I uh, am often mentioned together with my father, Geert Hofstede, Subtle difference in uh, first names. You have to blame him for that. (laughs) Uh, And he started a study when he was employed in a large multinational company on uh, employee satisfaction that uh, grew to have a life of its own in a serendipitous way because he happened to stumble on deep cross-national differences. I myself am a population biologist. I was a student when my father did his first work on these cultures and uh, later I became involved in his work when I was 40 now I'm 60 and what I've been doing is trying to find out how these cultural differences originate and perpetuate themselves what my dad found out and what has been confirmed by many other people since is that uh, at a deep level you could say that the metaphorical social landscape in which people live is different across societies And this is something, it's different, that people have great trouble perceiving. It is as if you were a fish and they asked you to describe the air. You live in the water, you have no idea about the difference between water and air until you have experienced both elements. And if you've always lived in one place in the world, then it's very hard for you to see that behaviors from another place that seem strange, illegal, ridiculous, or uh, sometimes attractive, 
but most of the time not, that those behaviors can make sense, but within a larger system, a larger cultural system. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if the teacher enters a class and all the children stand up, uh, that is deemed a very decent thing to do in some cultures. Uh, and, of course, it is mirrored in relationship between children and parents, employees and bosses, citizens and government. In other places in the world, this is deemed a ridiculous waste of time and it should not happen. And these things are embedded in the social landscape of a, a culture, of a country. It's not necessarily a country. It could be a part of a country. This kind of knowledge happens to be valid for all walks of life in that society. So it's not just organizational or it's not just about uh, information or about security or about industry or about anything. It's about the society as a whole the social landscape in which people live. In okay. that sense, it is also something that pertains to the population biology of the human species. Rather than having subspeciated, like ordinary decent mammals, we actually are one genetically quite homogenous species across the world, but we have divided across cultural boundaries. This makes us very versatile, but also very able to maintain culture um, constants. Right. And we do the same thing for every group that we create. So as soon as we create a new organization, that organization is also going to acquire a culture, yeah. although it is not necessarily a deep culture. We have deep cultures for our countries because yeah, we're in them from birth to death. In an organization, we may uh, enter after puberty when our deep value system is already in place. But still, organizations also create and maintain different cultures. So I guess to summarize what you're saying there is that as individuals, we are so immersed using the, the, the concept you said there about the fish in the water. We're so uh -huh. immersed in our own water that we, we don't actually recognize that we're in water. And that water is the culture um, the environment within which we lead our, our, our daily lives. That's sort yes. of what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So like, it affects, for instance, how we need to move. Huh? Uh, if we were in the air, we would have to move in a very different way and we have a different struggle with gravity. But mm -hmm. how do we know until we've experienced that? Okay, okay. Um, if we're unaware of, of the sort of the water around us, with the water being a metaphor for culture, uh -huh. how that may result in us interpreting things when we go and engage with other cultures in, in a different way. So we're maybe not necessarily recognising that that culture, that individual in that country is subject to its own culture, its own water, and that actually those two different types of water, may there may be a, a, a friction in there, or there might be an opportunity for actually collaborating more effectively. Yes, I'll give you uh, an example. This is a story that I heard, and it's, it played out in Philadelphia, USA, okay. where there are uh, large parking lots, and uh, it so happens, due to historic coincidences, that quite a few Ethiopian uh, people of Ethiopian descendants, but American people, uh, are involved in guarding these places. Okay. One of these people... Uh, was so competent and good that the WASP American uh, bosses wanted to make him uh, site uh, chief, so leader of uh, the whole parking uh, lot with thousands of cars. And he said, I can't do it. And uh, they said, oh, well, but why is that? I mean, you're good. We want to promote you. We want to make you successful in your career. And then he said, well, a number of the workers here uh, belong to a family to which my family owns a debt. So I have no sway over them. Right. So right. here you see that actually the Ethiopian guy was making mention of, as it were, the rules of the air to people who only knew the water. Yes. He's trying to explain to them, according to his social landscape, there were uh, impediments to his taking the new job, which was actually quite a courageous thing to do for him because he could have kept silent and then probably he would have had problems with that other family and with those people, with the result that there could have been uh, unpleasantness, of course. And you cannot obey two lords at the same time. And, and I guess the, the other interpretation on that particular scenario is that that individual could have remained silent and not actually explained to his managers, yes. who, were, who were from the U.S., and, you know, subject to the, I guess, influenced by the U.S. culture that they'd grown up with, 
well, yeah, yeah, you could say by 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 British culture ultimately or Irish, uh, yeah. because that's a very powerful force. Huh? If yeah. you look at the deep culture of the USA, it's very close to Anglo culture. Uh huh. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, he could have said nothing, and then those people who had sort of offered him the opportunity for promotion may have then taken, may have considered that in their own way. They may, they may have considered it as negative. So if he'd chosen not to say anything, then that there is a chance that actually people might have thought, you know, he's not interested in promotion. He's not interested in, in what we consider to be bettering himself. So, I, you know, that, that this, yes. it, it, it's an interesting point because I know in some cultures that the concept of actually speaking up about something that you feel is... Um, maybe painful. Maybe painful. Maybe something... Yeah, or maybe something that they assume that the other culture, the US culture, will uh, will understand it. You know, so, well, actually, yeah, and, and you can see a rub there straight away. I mean, how it can really have an impact upon just communicating. And without communication, how do, how does anything get done? How yes. do you bring about change? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So if you are all from the same culture, you know how to interpret the silence or the words of the other and the question, and so on, and the wider context. In some contexts, you may say other things than in other, others. If you are in your own town, in your own football team, or in your family, and probably after a few years, even your in-laws, then you know exactly what things mean. Yeah. But if you are in a cross-cultural situation, uh, in an organization, or uh, in a home kind of situation, then you have this extra layer of, wait a minute, if something uh, seems to be a little bit strange, have I correctly interpreted the system of meaning within which uh, this is being done or said? And uh, that's cross-cultural understanding. And if you don't have it, sooner or later, you run into big trouble uh, in uh, multicultural situations. So that's a brilliant, I mean, that's, that's an excellent way of taking us, I guess, to the, the crux of the challenge that we face within the security industry, which is, okay, how do you change culture in that in this intercultural connected society? You know, a lot of the people listening to this podcast are going to work for organisations that have operations around the world, um, mm-hmm. or uh, have maybe um, even if their operation is limited to the UK, but they supply their products and services all over the world. They mm-hmm. may be recruiting people because of the need to find the right skills and the shortages. They may be recruiting people from all over the world, and even in in some countries, obviously, they're much more multicultural than others. I know here in, in the UK, for example, you know, we've got this rich patchwork of cultures that yes. as a result of immigration. And yes. um, it brings with it, you know, huge variety, a huge variety of uh, opportunities. But then you suddenly find that you're working with people who've maybe grown up in different countries. And, um, and you know, that's really, pr- when I think about the people I know who work in London, they such a cool thing. And, and, and um so, so how, do, how, how do we start to tackle that that challenge of changing culture within organisations? Well, I think you take uh, maybe you take a step too fast. You talk about changing culture in organisations. I had been talking about different cultures meeting and uh, needing to uh, come to terms with one another to first have a step of wait a minute, am I uh, perceiving uh, the right stuff? Am I interpreting? In, uh, it in uh, in the appropriate way. Um, and so what is needed is mutual understanding. You don't necessarily need to become the same. If you think about the European Union or what remains of it after the uh, current uh, Brexit uh, situation, uh, even if Brexit does happen, then uh, understanding is needed between uh, the French, the Germans, the Italians, the uh, Brits, and so on. That does not mean that we need to become the same. It would be a pretty a ridiculous uh, requirement to say all the uh, people in the European Union need to become the same for it to work. That's mm. never going to happen, right? What mm-hmm. people do when they live is they develop their cultures so that more and more variety could be created. On, on the other hand, in order to work together, they need to have a more limited set of things that they agree on and that they they mutually understand. So what is actually needed is to create a sort of working culture, and you could call that an organization culture. So what I think is happening right now in the, let's say, more cosmopolitan parts of society in the world is 
that uh, people are developing an operational working culture for their organized lives that is not the same as the culture that's in their hearts and souls. Okay. And uh, there's a lot of that happening in London. You can hear people say, if you want to go to England, don't go to London, go to Manchester, because then you'll be, uh, be in England. In London, you're just in an international city. Mm, that's an interesting, that's a really interesting point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you could hold the opinion that London has an organizational culture. It's like, it's almost like a big organization instead of being a country. This is, of course, not true at all. But I think part of the um, turmoil of London is caused by uh, local, very English parts and uh, also immigration uh, parts where there are local um, cultures or groups of immigrants and the sort of operational, organizational, melting pot culture of the city. Okay. So for me to summarize it up for, for our listeners, so it's not about changing culture. I completely agree with you because I think culture enriches our lives. So why would we want to be changing it? So the first thing is about actually understanding that you have your culture, that yes. there is this water that surrounds you. You've got to recognize that because because if you don't recognize that and that other people have their own cultures, you then can never start the journey of one, accepting that you have one, they have one, they may be different and what those differences might be. But the next natural step is then coming up with a mutual understanding with those people in different cultures that you are working with or living with on the day-to-day -day basis. You know, this is how we can work together to achieve the, the you, know, a, you know, specific goals. And that's the mutual understanding that you're talking about. Is that, is that a good summary? It's a good summary. So that mutual understanding, of course, isn't created in the course of uh, an hour or a day. Depending on the deep culture, it could take a lifetime. And often what uh, uh, you, people from the UK do is they forget that. They live in a country where society is like a gas. So people are like loose atoms running to and fro, bumping into others, having a lot of fun and going on uh, their separate ways. Most societies are not like that. They are much more like a crystal. So people have a fixed place that in, includes responsibility that stays. It's not going away. So they're not free to move around and bump and leave like the Brits are. And this means that, find, as, let's say, getting to know somebody and establishing a relationship of mutual understanding and trust tends to be taken very seriously uh, and take more time in most other cultures than in the English culture. And also that you don't necessarily know the benefits of a new relationship. Uh, it might take a few years. So you might have met somebody you went for a meal, nothing much was uh, discussed, nothing at all was decided. So is that a loss of time? It might be that two years later you get a phone call, it turns out that they remember and they want to continue on that basis. So it might have been an investment. And I think that's an important message. So you can spend time on relationships uh, without any, let's say, tangible uh, outcome. It doesn't need to be lost time, it could be an investment. And if you can also enjoy that and, 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 and learn from it, you can embrace it, and I think the English can do that very well, then that can be a very profitable investment on both sides. But there's some loyalty involved, more so than the English are used to giving. They're more used to <laughs> <laughs> So if I had to summarize that again, I guess the, the thing that I pick up from there was the, um, the issue of time. This is really, really very, very important. It's not unusual for me over the years. I've had conversations with people and say, well, how can we uh, look at culture? You know, even the concept of thinking about changing culture, which the, then there are limitations around, uh, around that, uh, the, the sense of how can we do this? And it's almost like, and how can we do this in a year? And you're like, no, you're sort of, you're sort of failing to grip. The, the size of the challenge that you're looking at here mm -hmm. it takes time um it really does take a significant amount of time and you have to have that mindset at the beginning and the people that you work with need to understand that as well to avoid any uh disappointment that things aren't changing in you know this quarter or this year mm -hmm. and, and and I think by being realistic, you know, talk to anybody about change man management, you've got to set realistic expectations. I think, you know, that helps frame people's minds so there's a real, so there's an expectation and they, then people don't feel disappointed about the fact that it's taking 
um, it, that it takes time. I, the second point I'm going to raise with you, and I, I really would value your, your thoughts on this. A lot of the people who are sort of listeners to the podcast, um, uh-huh. their intercultural uh, experience often involves you know, dealing with people within the information security function that uh-huh. are spread around the world. And actually, they don't talk to them every day. They might not talk to them every week. And when it comes to sort of security awareness and behavior and culture, they may only talk to them when they need to because they've got a specific project on the, card, on the yes. cards. So how does that level of interaction potentially affect the likelihood of you ever getting to understand, you know, to identify the cultural differences, to accept them between all the various stakeholders and to come up with a sort of a mutual understanding about how you're going to address that. That lack of time or that infrequency, I, I'm just, from what you said, I'm thinking that's, that could significantly have an impact upon the chances of you ever, ever really coming up with that mutual understanding. Yes. Well, of course, if it's about information security, there is also a professional body of knowledge including a culture involved. And that actually facilitates communication. So in part, one security industry uh, individual from one country and another from a different country sort of know uh, the tricks of their trade. Mm-hmm. And that, is, that makes things easier. But uh, it could be that sometimes uh, they sort of surpass that range. Uh, for instance, uh, in thinking about the um, uh, nature and seriousness of threats, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, if in my country, the Netherlands, we talk about uh, security, then until recently, almost we really talked about safety and accidents happening. The idea of willful um, uh, fraud uh, was much less uh, prominent in our minds. I think time things are changing now with the internet, but the Anglo mind is much more uh, ready to see evil intention. And so these unwritten assumptions about intentions of people, of course, could then lead to misunderstanding. And then I, I would like to go back to the, this idea of investments. Invest in cross-cultural understanding. Never know when it will pay back, but it probably will. Okay. Shall we just pick up upon that? So you know, once you've got that mutual understanding, what's of the fact that you do have differences, but a mutual understanding about how you're going to look to to leverage those differences in some cases, because, you know, difference is good. I'm a real believer that difference is good. You know, learning from other cultures, how people do things. I think that sometimes provides breakthroughs for humanity that we're really struggling with. But at the same time, obviously, it does create, in some cases, the perception of, and I think it it is a perception issue where people see it as friction. They see it as a problem, as a barrier. That's it. As a barrier, that's often a, a term used. You know, the the differences in culture is a barrier to progress. Do you think it's it, it, it's not really negative, is it? I mean, for me, it's the case of well, there, this provides opportunity. It's not a negative thing. Do you think that people perceive it that way? Yeah, I mean, it's it's like uh, the the uh, the state of the of affairs that you have day and night, and it's light in the day and not in the night. This is just the way things are. Uh, <laughs> And it's sometimes a challenge and sometimes an advantage and sometimes it's uh, really a pity, but that's how things are. So, so it is with culture. Yeah. And of course, if you, uh, if you don't do anything about it, you just say it doesn't exist, then with a bit of luck, you never have to revise your opinion. But it could also be that uh, instead of realizing that there are cross-cultural issues, you just think that people from some places or some countries are all bastards because yeah. you fail to understand them. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. And it's actually something happening between the English and the Germans that uh, keeps cropping up, you know. If you come up with a proposal, let's say there's a new information security system of some kind, and it's really clever, and you have a German delegation who's coming to brief about it, then the English style would be to sort of boast the advantages and uh, the main line of the properties of the new system. If the Germans are interested, they will then start to ask very pointed and specific questions. Typically, the English will be pissed because they feel this is kind of rude and missing the intent of the benefits the new thing will will bring. Uh Whereas if the Germans are not interested, they will fail to ask pointed questions. And the English would maybe be happy about that, about the more non-committal answers. 
And this kind of dynamic, if you know that there are, let's say, culture-bound patterns of showing certain emotions, that helps you a great deal. And then you can sort of get past the difficult point and uh, get along really fine. Yeah. And this is one example, but of course there are many of those examples having to do with people from different places in the world. I just mm. mentioned this because there's this running gag in the UK of don't mention the war, and uh, it's sort of refueled all the time by uh, this kind of little incidents. Because yeah. after all, it's a lot of trade between the Germans and the Brits. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I don't think it's right now. I mean, a, a, a bit like you, obviously, before we actually started recording this chat, I, I was I was reading. Um, I was reading the Guardian and the BBC websites, and obviously there's a lot of conversation going on at the moment about about Brexit, uh-huh. and, and and the funny thing is, you know, people get their information from from the media, and um, you know, the media presents it in in, in one way, and it's part of is a tool of of the negotiation in its own way. <laughs> you know, it presents a particular picture to get sure. people behind something, and yes. it was you know, the, it's the, they were talking about. The Brexit, you know, the British um, negotiating with the European Union, but then it was specifically picking out Germany. And, you know, for me, it's like, yeah, we all have, we all have our different ways of considering things, interpreting things, um, and that's heavily influenced by a culture. And if you don't take that into consideration, actually what you end up doing is potentially creating conflict over something with which there is no conflict. They're just slightly different inter- interpretations of the same point. But Quite with the objective so. of getting to the, to the same way. And yes. it's, it's that friction as a result of sometimes not identifying the fact that this is difference, a cultural difference, not accepting that there will always be a cultural difference, and not having this sort of common mutual understanding that you talk about um, agree between the various parties that results in actually then people maybe moving further away from each other when we should be coming towards each other. Negotiation is about actually coming towards and yeah. agreeing. And, yes. and actually sometimes, if you don't, and like you said, if you don't identify and accept it, you actually end up moving away because you, you, haven't, you haven't really seen the entire picture. And, and I do wonder whether or not sometimes within information security, when we're having those conversations, you know, if, if we haven't taken those first three steps you talk about, whether that actually pushes us away, which means that ultimately we're not climbing towards coming up with great programs to help raise awareness and you know influence behaviour and, and to develop an organisational culture which truly values information security. So can I ask you, Yes. after the mutual understanding, what is the next step? I would say uh, also even before the mutual understanding, but in, par- in parallel... Uh, if you're thinking of an industry that needs to work across uh, nations, and of course, very obviously, information security happens to do just that, uh, you can uh, think strategically about corporate diplomacy. In politics, diplomacy is very, very uh, important. What is its main function? To avoid painful situations where you get uh, hurt feelings, because people with hurt feelings are no longer interested in agreeing and uh, diplomats want people to agree. So you can think about corporate diplomacy in uh, the industry and about situations where it's actually not happening or not being catered for and how this might hamper communication. If you have had some phone calls with your colleague from a certain other country a few times and they don't seem to be delivering, they don't answer your questions or uh, they are rude or somebody else takes the phone instead of the person you need, Before long, you don't want anymore. So you start to send unfriendly emails, and that's probably the beginning of the end. So what you need instead is to have people who are boundary spanners. They know uh, the unwritten rules of the social game in both countries involved, who can then talk to people who are responsible for processes. And for instance, very often, having a face-to-face meeting between people in a pleasant situation, everybody feels okay, everybody feels valued, can be a really good way to establish a working relationship. Again, investment. It's not cost, it's investment. And if you have bosses who, for some reason, maybe their lives are being made difficult by very tight schedules or targets, who for some reason cannot afford to invest, then it might backfire. Mm. Because you can create this ill feeling, you haven't got the diplomacy in place. 
it, it's a bit similar to sometimes what you call breakdowns of, uh, of good feeling or coherence. Could be within a country, could be between countries. Huh? Wars yeah. and conflicts tend to happen without anybody wanting them to happen, but because nobody takes the trouble to strategically avoid them by creating diplomacy. So, and, and you're using the word diplomacy, so I'm going to use another metaphor around diplomacy. You mentioned there about having people that stood on both sides of the fence, so they understood one culture and they understood the other culture. These are the sort of like cultural ambassadors, if we can use that, if we can carry on that diplomacy yes, thing yes, yes. G- going on. Yeah. And, and which is interesting because I know in, our, in the security industry we often talk about um, you know, security ambassadors uh, to help bridge the gap between information security and the rest of the organisation. Cultural ambassadors, would it be better that the cultural ambassador is an, another information security person or somebody that's outside of information security but is um, somebody that maybe reflects the broader business in that particular country. And the reason I asked this question is that going back earlier in, in, in our chat today, you mentioned how, you know, there's this information security people, even across different nations and different cultures, uh-huh. um, they have this common thread that runs through them already. That's the, the language of information security, you know, uh-huh. the, 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 the sort of the objectives, the vision. Uh-huh. Uh, so you have that. So on one hand, that's a strength. But if your objective is to try and influence the behavior of people in a variety of other cultures, the majority, and I do mean the majority, maybe 95, 99.95% of people that you're trying to influence and communicate with, they're not security people. So when it comes to those cultural ambassadors, do you think it's better for us to think about having an ambassador who comes from our sort of target audience, the people we're trying to influence, or do you think it's better to have somebody who's a cultural ambassador that's an information security specialist who lives in that particular country. Well, I think usually you won't have the choice. I mean, there aren't so many people in your company probably who could take that role. So you have people who have the personality, the experience, the charisma that it takes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Next, uh, about their specialism, I would say the main thing is that they be accepted by everybody. So uh, they be acceptable. If you have controversial people who are accepted by some but not others, then it could be that they only are used by factions to to divide uh, themselves further from one another. Uh, But it could certainly be a security, uh, information security professional, why not? And it also depends if you have uh, countries that value specialism and specialistic knowledge a lot, then it might actually be better to have a specialist. The Brits are not into specialism. You like generalism. But many other cultures are much more into specialism. So they like diplomas and specialist uh, knowledge and also sort of a, a display of specialism as a way to show that you are a credible person, which is one of the things involved in Germanic detail that shows that you know something, which builds credibility in the Germanic world. That's a really interesting insight. That's a really interesting insight, how different cultures have a different view upon the, the, what you're reflecting there. The, the Brits tend to like the generalist. You're talking mm-hmm. about G- Germanic cultures tend to like those people have, you know, are, are seen as really real experts in, in their specific domain. I personally definitely, definitely, definitely come, come, come across that. And I think it's an, an another thing. When I think about the uh, other guests that we've interviewed, quite often people talk about almost like the personal brand mm. of the person that you're relying upon, you know, to act as the ambassador, do they have a brand which appeals to the um, the audience that they're trying that that they're there to influence and to support within that particular you know operation, that particular culture, mm-hmm. for example? And part of that personal brand is, is is your personal brand aligned to the culture of not just the organisation but the the country within which that organisation is is based? Are you a, a technical specialist are you seen as the technical uh, specialist because if you are it gives credibility whereas maybe in another country you know it is about being a generalist and you know are you are you able to join all the different dots between all the different players that are are in the particular room i, I think that's really interesting and it, it ties in very nicely with with previous interviews that we've done it uh, done as no, well I quite, I quite agree with you so actually in order to be uh, acceptable 
in different cultures, you need to uh, be competent in slightly different games with unwritten rules. That's what you are saying, and it's true. Mm. Yeah. You need to be a diplomat in many ways. <laughs> in, in, so uh, if, if we define a diplomat or a uh, corporate ambassador as somebody who is good in adapting to local form while uh, staying faithful to content that they have to somehow defend or broadcast themselves. Mm. Yes. Okay. So the point you made there, because uh, I said, you know, what's the next step for mutual understanding? And, and you were like, oh, actually, it, it's probably in parallel with mutual understanding. There's this under, we need to have this sort of corporate diplomacy, um, you know, engaging people like cultural ambassadors who understand both sides of the coin. And then we basically got on to the point that that cultural ambassador will need to have a personal brand which reflects the culture within which they operate. So past the mutual understanding side of things what is the next step in terms of you know you've come to mutual understanding is that a mutual understanding about this is the reality of the world that we face or is that a mutual understanding about how are you going to go about achieving your goals with that mutual understanding is it like a process that you go through or is it just you know recognition and you know it's just good enough to recognize it or that there are differences in culture or is it a case of once you've recognized it this is something we can do something about yeah, we were almost back to, to Giddens here. Huh? We have both the structure of the social world and uh, the way in which to move around in that world. And they're obviously uh, dependent on one another. For instance, in many countries in the Mediterranean uh, and in Slav world and Latin world, society is in fact like a pyramid. So rather than being a leader, you can be a boss. Rather than be a follower, you can be a subordinate. Uh, which means that processes in organizations go very much along hierarchical lines. In, if you're in a pyramid, you will do something if the stone above you does something. Otherwise, you will stay put. And you have a specialism with this, which is to be that stone in that position in the pyramid. If you are uh, in an English society, you are in a sort of market situation. So what you do in order to be successful is to... Uh, boast about your products. Uh, your, you, you, you use the word brand just now. You're your own brand. Mm -hmm. And uh, you try to get people to buy into your brand. Yeah. And that brand can then uh, become a very good brand. Huh? Uh, you have uh, Paul McCartney. Uh, he became Sir Paul McCartney because he's a very good brand. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how you can get along in a markets oriented society. So I'm not talking about economy. I'm talking about the unwritten metaphor of society. It's a market. You go to a pyramid uh, country, then the concept of brand doesn't apply so much. What you have to do is be the top stone in the pyramid, and for that you have to keep the other stones below you. Well, if you look at what ha what's happening in Turkey now, it's very visible. Huh? You have Erdogan, who was big friends with Gülen for many years, and then at some moment it uh, appeared that you can't have two top stones of the pyramid. Of course, you do have uh, the king dramas in England. But the, the metaphor of society underlying is different, so you tend to have different dynamics. So process and structure in society are intricately related. That's the, the short of it. Okay. So does that mean that to bring about change in different societies, um, you know, so I imagine an organization with uh, operations in different, in, in different countries, mm -hmm. um, that you need to really understand the dynamic in terms of that structure you've just spoken about to then more effectively plan, develop a strategy about how you're going to bring about change yes. in those... It, right, okay, yes. So Fine. There's, there's uh, who decides about things and what are the processes through which this happens. These are very important. Uh, are uh, things like relationship ties and uh, dinners... And gifts uh, part of the process? Are decisions collaborative or uh, do you really, really need some individuals to take those decisions? Right, okay. Actually, there are two more metaphors that I didn't describe that fit this, uh, this image. We talked about the market, England, and the pyramids, five countries. We've not talked about the machine, Germanic countries. We talked about it before. The Germanic uh, countries... Everybody's more or less equal, but things are tightly coupled. 
So you want predictability. It's very important. Yeah? There is a saying about change in, in, uh, in German, which is then schon, then schon. If we do it, we really do it. So there's a tendency in Germany, uh, when you talk about change, to say no until you can really, really say yes. In England, there's a tendency to say yes and then to see what will happen. Ah, now that's it. <laughs> because change is good for its own sake. In a market, change is good. It means you have a bigger stall to sell more stuff. Yeah, and that's really interesting, actually. This is very symbolic. So it, you can have you can easily have misunderstandings when you talk about change. Yeah, you can have uh, you can have uh, the Russian saying, "Well, change is threatening me. I don't want to talk about change." You can have the Germans saying, "Wait a minute, how are we going to do this change? Wait a minute, we haven't decided about that yet." And you can have the Brits saying, "What are you moaning about? We need change." You know. <laughs> I just yeah, I'm smiling because I'm, I'm I'm very fortunate that I travelled and worked quite widely. And and as you're saying these things, it's just reminding me of scenarios, you know, I, the situations I found myself in. And um, and I love the word about the, the the British thing about change. You know, just it's almost like yeah, of course change has happened. I'm going to say that we're going to change, but then it's like okay, so how is this change going to happen? What is the process of change? Yeah. How do we even know that things have actually changed? I think we're Brexit anyway. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's very, I tell you what, when I think about uh, the challenges we face within within the security industry, which are actually uh -huh. common challenges uh, uh, across all manner of different industries and professions, you know, how organizations often come up with, like, you know, in our case, they come up with an information security policy or an end user policy type thing, an acceptable use policy. And it's been written and the organization has invested a significant amount of time and effort um, to produce the document. And then it's like, okay, so it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it's interesting in, in, in previous podcasts, uh, I, you know, I think straight away of, um, of Robert Madeline, who was the uh, ex-director general for the European Commission on Health, and, and he was talking about, yeah, how people come up with policy. And then it's like, yeah, the policy is supposed to influence behavior. So even though you've documented it, how does it actually influence behavior? What's the process that you've got for doing this? Yes. And, and it just because it's written and because that's your intention, it doesn't, you've got to have a plan about getting it there. And that's the Germanic thing that you were talking about. Yes. And I definitely experienced that where, you know, an organization has set a, uh, it, it has come to an agreement this is where we'd like to go. But they've also got a plan about how we're going to get there. Uh -huh. And and it's uh -huh. very detailed. Yes. Um, and they're absolutely 100% committed to doing it. Uh -huh. And that's yes. all the stakeholders. Yes. They have, they've got everybody lined up behind that vision. So, um, uh, yes, it yeah, does make me We have a saying in Dutch, the Dutch are between the English and the Germans, where the nose and the mouth in the same direction. We have to get the noses pointing in the same direction. And this is yes. what you said, everybody has to be lined up. So it can take a long time before everybody's lined up, and then, wham, they will move. Yeah? Okay. So there's one more metaphor uh, that I briefly want to mention because I promised you two more, and that is the family. So in Asia, China, and Southeast Asia, and also all around Africa, the metaphor is neither the market, nor the machine, nor the pyramid. It is the family, which means it's hierarchical, Daddy, sometimes mummy, but usually daddy, is uh, at the top, but it's also free regarding to uh, roles. So if you are in favor with daddy, you get a lot of leeway. And that uh, is a very different model from the pyramid where you uh, are confined by your specialism and your, uh, your role. In a family, uh, you have a lot of freedom, but not beyond a certain level because there's somebody above you. So if you really want to make anything happen, you have to go talk to number one. That's a family. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I, I love that. We've got those five metaphors for describing culture. You got five? I thought I had four. Five? Oh, let me think. Let me, let me add this up. I've never been very good at maths, but well, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're just one of these exaggerating market-oriented Brits who want ah. to make <laughs> Just squeeze another one in. <laughs> 
no, no, it's the sum of the parts is greater than the individual numbers. That's that. Okay, <laughs> which is, okay. I, I will buy that from you. Yeah, you buy that. <laughs> yeah. I remember that was an old BMW advert. Okay, the sum of the parts is greater than the value of it. And, and then, then there's part of me that goes, and that's the reason why you pay a premium. But um, anyway, <laughs> going back to we got we got family, which is uh, Asia and Africa. Okay, uh, we've got machine, which is the, uh, the sort of the G- Germanic nations. Yeah. Uh, Japan we've got... is also close to that uh, region and in the north of Italy as well. So, but Ooh, it's like okay. wait. Okay, yeah, I, yeah, okay, that's interesting. Is that because of the? It, there's a real mixture north of Italy. You know, even you go there to look at people, it, it, it's quite. It, there's been a lot of movement around that area because I would have thought Italy would have come underneath the Mediterranean, which is pyramid. Yes, uh, but Italy is quite divided, as Italians can tell you, eh, whether they're from Padania, which is uh, the Po Valley in the north, or yep. from the middle or from the south. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they don't necessarily love one another so much either. Um, but they also have different societal structures and a very, very different history. So if you go look into European history, you will see that it's so rich and uh, so any reference to Europe uh, using today's uh, national frontiers is bound to be a gross underestimation of the path dependencies and complexity. I think path dependence is a very important word. So in culture, there's always a history. And usually people who explain culture pick one specific episode or element in history and say it's because of that. It's because of the the Soviets. It's because of the Nazis. Uh, but you can go back longer and you can find other causes. It's because of the Holy Roman Empire. It's because mm. of the, the Romans uh, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, history has very deep roots. And if you have a long history with many changes like in Europe, uh, then the path of dependence becomes quite intricate and complicated and very, very interesting. Uh, yeah. To uh, summarize this, it, people in business should uh, give more, pay more attention to history and historians. Mm, okay, and uh, I, I, I'm passionate about history. I just think there's so many lessons, and it, 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 it's sort of infer- you can see this quite widely. You go, we regularly don't learn from the lessons of our past, yes. and you just you just got to wonder sometimes where we would be if we had learned from lessons of our well, past. Go in, some, to- in some instances, we do learn, and then we forget about it. But yes, I, yes. I, I agree with your statement it's very That'd much. Be- that would be the goldfish in the bo- in 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 the bowl problem that we have, you know, <laughs> the people's yes. perception that we have short term memory. But um, going back to those five points, okay, there's five metaphors. So we've got the family, Asia and Africa. We've got um, the machine, which is Germanic, North Italy type of region. We've got the market, which is the uh, very Anglo-Saxon. So that would be the, the UK and North America predominantly. We've got pyramid, which is the Mediterranean. And Slavic countries. So you've got one, two, three, four. You were right. Absolutely. We have four metaphors. <laughs> I was wrong. I was being very British and adding an extra one in there. <laughs> um, there are there are other metaphors. If you refine this, you can see differences. But I don't think we need to talk about that now because no. uh, we yeah. might be overdetailing the picture. For a long time. But I, I guess it, one thing it does sort of, and, and it, it's a, and it's, it sort of, I guess, builds a little bit on the, the, the history point you make, is that culture actually isn't really restricted to a national boundary, is it? Because historically... No, no, no. The... nations are very new inventions, and culture has million-year-old basis. So, no, it would be very strange. On the other hand, nations do have very powerful enforcers of culture. So... Uh, if you think of uh, get into one more time structuration theory, cult, uh, nations have language, they have yeah. schooling systems, they have all kind of indoctrination systems. Uh, so that helps. But if you look at the cultural maps of the world, you will usually see that uh, culture doesn't uh, give you black or white opposites on both sides of a border. Of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you are an island, it might be a little bit different. I remember Charles de Gaulle, uh, the French president after mm-hmm. the Second World War, saying that we, d- we don't want uh, England in the European Union. They have an island mentality. Mm. And uh, they will always want to do their own thing. Uh, that's a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
But it, these these things don't change so quickly. I mean, it is true, you know, rule Britannia, 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 Britannia rules the waves. Britons never, never, never will, shall be slaves. I mean, this is a deeply felt thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I, and I'm thinking in a way, and a reflection on that point, when we talk and you, it, regularly within the security industry, the information security, the cybersecurity industry, we talk about changing culture. Or at least understanding it if you cannot change it. So maybe sometimes you can change things in the inside the industry, and especially you can change something when you set up something new. So every new organization uh, is a point in a pointed equilibrium space from which you can build a new path dependence. You can mm-hmm. hire people, you can set up a, a common culture with these people, and you can achieve something. Once yeah. you have a going concern, many, many people who are all influencing one another, uh, then uh, if you push it in a, in a place, it will move, but not necessarily in the sense that you try to push it. Because mm-hmm. it's it's not a firm thing, it's a squishy thing. Yeah. And for a country, this holds a fortiori. It has millions of people. You cannot change its culture purposely. It will change, yeah. but not according to anybody's purpose. And do, do you think, we've, we've spoken a lot about culture within the context of nations, which we've already said, that, you know, culture covers a number of different nations. You might have a culture like Germanic, which will include a number of different nation states. But if you go back to, you know, the Chinese, the, the security, the listeners will be this, will, will, will face, they'll be talking about, you know, we've got an organisational culture here. Um, the relationship between the national culture and the organisational culture, I mean, I've got some really strong views on it, but I just wondering, you know, can you have an organisational culture which is which is really out of tilt with the culture outside of the office, you know, or, or, or are they sort of... One, they have one, different one... functions. Right. So they have different functions. The word culture applies to both because it's about, uh, let's say, unwritten drivers and beliefs and values of behaviour. But organisation culture really doesn't need to be deep. As long as you know uh, how to behave from nine to five, as it were, although this, is, this might not necessarily be true, but you don't need to believe in the same gods, go to the same churches, eat the same food, have the same uh, bedtime habits in order to work together profitably and well in a company. Uh-huh. Of course, this does depend on the nature of the societal culture. Right? Some societal cultures are much more demanding in terms of every little, little detail of the lives of people than others. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. also, uh, some organizational cultures are more, more demanding. I've worked for one company in the Netherlands uh, about which uh, I heard one uh, rather new member tell us how his wife had said after three months in the company, his wife had told him, this company that you're working for, it's not a company, it's a sect. Uh-huh. So if an organization culture gets attributes that are sort of deeper than just nine to five, then people might start to call it a sect. Mm. If sect has an army, well, it's a country. So, mm-hmm. you see, there are sort of in-between things, but normally, and this is also uh, confirmed by uh, good research, organization culture is about understanding of practices. How do you dress up? Are you late or not for meetings? Is the process of doing something important? Are people important? These kind of things. Whereas in country culture... Uh, this is about deep values, and we talked about it. This kind of metaphor for society. Period. And and where you know, I, I paint a picture. You know, so an organisation is set up. Um, just call it Country X um, to avoid any, any diplomatic issues. Um, but you can imagine there's Country X. The organisation set up in there. It's employing from the local workforce. And that local workforce, when it comes through the door, it's already been submerged in that sort of local national culture, for example, or and and that and they bring with them a range of values, which suddenly what happened? You know, they bring them into the workspace. So you might then have an organisational culture which has been documented, and maybe that's the culture that's in other countries that the organisation operates with, but. How much consideration do you have to give to the fact that, you know, if your workforce is from this particular culture, then it's fine that you've documented what your expectations are of people and, and what the values of the organization are that you have these, you know, your mission statement, all those type of things. 
But how does embedding that within the people who come to work for you, what what are the challenges? I mean, you know, it seems to me that if your values as an organization are maybe out of tilt with the values within that the actual culture that you're recruiting from, do you yeah, have probably a what you can mean is not the values of your organization, but the values of the leaders of the organization. Ah. Uh, they they are from a different culture. So if you, as Brits, start an organization, let's say in uh, mainland China, somewhere in uh, in Chongqing or a big inland town, you can expect many of your workers, suppose you have sort of uh, blue collar, lower level workers. These workers, they are from villages, from agricultural uh, contexts. They uh, take uh, jobs for a season and they expect to be housed by the boss. This fits the family metaphor, okay? They mm-hmm. are your adopted sons for uh, for that time. English mm-hmm. bosses would normally say, I pay you, you take care of that yourselves. Huh? I don't want to assume that uh, I have anything other than a working relationship. This can create misunderstandings very easily. So what the, the English then have to do is not talk about company values, but be clever, act globally, think locally, make sure they have a boundary spanner, which is local Chinese people, who can tell them how they should treat their, em- their Chinese employees if they want them to be happy and work well. Mm-hmm. It's, it's actually common sense. The, so the, the term company values, I believe, is much overused in Anglo parlance, in the US and England, mm-hmm. to, and, and Australia, to indicate uh, basically company blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> current company hype spread by leaders and uh, defining the political correctness of the day. Mm. When really values are things like markets, live in a market, and uh, so the product and the rule of the day uh, is very important. And that is sort of uh, something that the political correctness thing derives from. And if you know that you might be operating in a country where actually it's a family or it's a machine or it's a pyramid, then all you need to do is make sure you have somebody who knows the, the local rules of the game and mm-hmm. that you can also talk with it's and respect. Yep. And then you can start to work in a mutually pro- profitable way. And so your organizational culture will then have a measure of respect for differences, respect for local values. That will be an ingredient of your company culture for sure. Hmm. And I think, I mean, I, I use a phrase very regularly in conversations with people when we're having these sort of discussions around the intercultural uh, opportunities and challenges around uh, information security, awareness and, and behaviour and development and strategy. Glocal is the one I use, uh-huh. um, which is this sense of you may have a centralised um, overall structure, but you need that local context to fine tune how you go about delivering things but also in terms of defining what it is you're delivering. Mm-hmm. What, what I often see is that uh, something might be designed, you know, a, an awareness program, for example, might be designed in, in the United Kingdom or North America or any other country. And then it's, it's all the design, you know, identifying the objectives, how you're going to achieve that. All that is done sort of centrally. And then the only thing that happens in terms of engaging with the local knowledge is to pass out, this is what we're going to do. What do you think? <laughs> it, it, we're looking. We're looking for you just to review it, not to contribute to the development of it. Yes, and then you have. If you do that to uh, people in a uh, machine or in uh, a pyramid, they have a problem because they have a structure that cannot be just be changed. So they will actually be faced with a non sequitur. Huh? They get mm-hmm. a program for change with no indication of how to do it. So that's difficult. If you tell it that to people who are in a family structure, then the big question is, who are you to tell me this? Yeah. Uh, are you my favorite son-in-law, Jared Kushner? Then maybe you can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> course, that's not, a, that's not a, a family structure so much, but anyway, it, it seems to be uh, some of them. Yeah. So um, uh, what I'm telling you here is that if you just have a process approach saying, here, here are the targets uh, that you have to meet, you're very much doing that from a market-oriented societal view. Society, yeah, yeah. Yes, and uh, the step of integrating these aims with the local culture still have to be taken. Yeah. It's not entirely impossible that if you had done that up front, you would have come up with different plans. Yeah. And so I quite agree that uh, going local and implying that before you 
new uh, London-based uh, plan from ages already uh, engage with uh, people with local people and you co-develop that's probably very clever yeah but okay. you need and i mean this is not necessarily given to anglo leaders they because something i haven't said yet is that in the markets uh, quadrant you can be either more macho or more feminine and if you compare uh, the scandinavian countries and netherlands with england and with mm. the anglo countries you see that they're also all, also markets but uh, muscle show and uh, uh, come across as strong uh, are very valued in Anglo society and not in Scandinavia or the Netherlands. Yeah. So that uh, sort of coming up with a plan that's malleable and it can be changed by others and you can collaborate on it is not necessarily something that you should do in England. Huh? So Peter mm -hmm. May has made a great show of strength. And yeah. of course, in a situation where you might have to negotiate with powerful partners, such as in this Brexit situation, that is actually a very difficultly tenable position. But it's societally, uh, it's, it's enforced by the British context. You have to mm. be like that or else you're not a good leader. So she's in a fix because of that. Yes. And the same would happen with a company trying to, uh, an English company trying to do things abroad. Uh, and certainly if it's about information security, and which is always very much about the fabric of society, and you haven't thought about that fabric of that other society, then, I mean, yeah, you uh, you have a long way to go from your own homebrew, uh, homebrewed program to an implementation. Yeah, that's great. Now, I, I've got this. This is all. I, I've got a question for you. And, and when when we first got in contact, I said, "Ah, oh, I'm going to I've got to ask you this question." This is something in all the, you know, in all the workshops I've done, a conversation that I have with people around a sort of awareness, behavior, and culture. I always throw this at people, and I'm surprised about how many people who you know attend an event or have you know the responsibilities for security culture uh -huh. uh, how many people don't have an answer to this and they always say to me oh can you can you give me an answer and, and i and i use all lots of different things and my personal belief is that you need to develop your own definition but i'm going to ask you this question because i'm pretty sure that you've got an answer for this what's a definition for culture <laughs> How would you define uh, well, it? What okay. is it? Yeah, I'll give you a few simple definitions to choose from. Uh, the very simple one, it's like your nose. So uh, if you look at people, you, you immediately see their noses and make inferences about them, but you yourself do not see your own nose. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> okay. And uh, your nose will be similar to the noses of uh, people you were born and raised with, probably. That's also an interesting fact. So this is a simple one. A uh, slightly different one uh, that doesn't carry mistaken racial connotation. It's, yeah. it's how you grew up, how you were born and raised. Yeah. So when you are uh, born and raised, uh, the basic issue is you should learn how to behave, full stop. Right. And that could mean how to behave as a man or as a woman. Yes. You're a real man. Uh, it could mean how to be clean. It could mean how to be strong. It could be how to be compassionate. So what behaving means uh, is what you are taught uh, when you're young, and this differs from society to society. So mm -hmm. culture is what does it mean to behave as a good member of society? That's a like social norms. Is, 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 and is of it... course, if you go into more detail and you, you add some socio, social science jargon, you will start to talk about norms and values. Yes. Yeah. But then you also complicate the discussion because you get the situation where, for instance, for me, value would mean a shared attitude towards the fabric of social life that may not be conscious and that is shared between everybody who is in the same society. For mm -hmm. most people in the anger world, the word value means a conviction that I have and that I'm passionate about. Right. It's not at all the same thing and you get lots of confusion. Okay. A okay. Norm could be a rule. It could be uh, an unwritten rule that nobody has ever uh, been conscious about. It could be, this is more like the water and air metaphor. So yeah. uh, if you say it's how you were born and raised and what is important to children in this particular part of the world when they're born and raised, is it discipline, is it compassion, is it respect for elders, and so on. These mm -hmm. things very quickly bring you to the heart of culture. Go to a primary school in any country. Have a look around. 
you will see so much that tells you things about how uh, a workflow in that same country will look. Okay. I've got a definition for culture. Well, it's not, I don't know if it's the definition for culture, but it's something I often use. Um, it's, um, it's like an energy field that's created by all living things. It surrounds us, penetrates us, and binds the galaxy together. Now, this is actually Obi-Wan Kenobi from Star, from Star Wars. And it's the sense of, it's that bowl. It's the, the energy is, instead of water, it's the energy, and it surrounds us. And it sort of binds us, but it's something that you don't you don't see, you put, you, you don't recognize. You, you it, it's just there. You mm-hmm. probably don't realize that it's there. And I remember when I first started doing research into awareness, behavior, and culture, which is like five five six years ago. The the new version of the Star Wars film had come out, and I was taking my children along, and I, I was like, yeah, that sort of makes sense now. Having done all this reading, I'm like. Ah, yeah, I could use a Star Wars quote at last in one of my presentations. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, like, oh, the, 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 the workshops we've been doing with ISC Squared this year, my whole presentation is a Star Wars theme, um, which is really interesting itself because you can see in the audience, because it's mainly a European audience that we've been presenting, presenting to, you can see they're like, wow, Star Wars, brilliant. But then you can also see some members of the audience going, Oh no! Here we go. <laughs> culture. It's a culture thing. May the force be with you. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So look, it's been wonderful talking to you. But um, we've had a couple of scenarios which have been, you know, submitted to us. We like to sort of open the books and allow people to suggest maybe things that they would like to raise to you. I know that I said to you that we were going to have a chat, and the whole chat would be about an hour. Do you know? Do you know where we're at at the moment? Yes, an hour and a half. But over. Right. Okay. So, w- what do you want to do? Can we? Do you want to just say, "Look, this has been brilliant," and let's not do the scenarios? Or maybe we could do a second chat about the scenario. Maybe uh, in a month's time or two months' time in January, we could bring the scenarios and go, "Look, this is a follow up to the chat with Erkan," and maybe that's a better way to do I think, it. I think this conversation uh, was really nice. I've also enjoyed myself vastly, uh, but also probably it has been pretty dense and. For podcast listeners, it might be a good moment to take a break now. So maybe we should not do that. Uh, we can also just see what happens, you know, depending on any re- reactions you get from the podcast. I'm certainly not unwilling to um, talk with you again at some point. January might be difficult, but let's see. I'm really confident that, um, you know, the listeners would have gone, ah, oh, that is a really good chat with somebody that has been able to throw some light on the challenges that we face. And, and if there was, you know, we can do a follow-up in maybe, I don't know, maybe March. I am absolutely confident that uh, we'd have uh, we'd have people waiting to see that being published. So yeah, let, let's do that. Let's, let's, let's catch up in the early part of next year and, and schedule something maybe for March next year, depending on your availability. Okay. It's been, I so thoroughly enjoyed it. And it, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. And, um, and I really do appreciate the fact that you've given over your time. And I'm just really happy that you found the work that we're doing, you know, asking the questions about culture within the context of information security, which is an important thing for society. I'm just I'm glad that you recognised that and you were willing to spend some time talking about these types Yes, and getting more important by the day. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, I shall let you crack on before we solve the Brexit issue ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bruce, uh, thank you very much. I thought it was really a very good conversation. I also like the, the fact that we didn't quite stick to what we thought we'd do, uh, but it was good all the same. Brilliant. Okay. Have a okay. fantastic day and a fantastic weekend. Yes. Bye-bye now. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Hi there. Well, I guess you may have got a sense of how excited I was in that particular chat with our guest, Hertian Hostida, today. I am absolutely blown away that he's actually offered to come back and to spend some more time talking to us. I think, you know, uh, we originally told him that we probably need about an hour of his time, but we well and truly went above that. And so clearly, you know, he was enjoying talking about it. I was really enjoying talking with him about it. And so, yeah, we're going to get him back on the show. And um, bearing that in mind, you really did enjoy the chat that we did today. You're probably going to want prodding and reminding when that particular 
interview is going to be made available. But let me tell you about the best ways to stay in contact with us here at the Rethinking Human Factor podcast. The first and the most obvious one is to go to the Marmalade Box website and the podcast section and sign up to the RSS feed. Alternatively, you know, we're on iTunes, so you can go and find us on iTunes and you can sign up to the feed there. The second way is to go back to the Marmalade Box website and sign up for the newsletter. Now, the newsletter isn't just about the podcast. The newsletter is a real hash. It's uh, bringing together all the stuff that we find really interesting, both developed in-house and out-house in relation to awareness, behavior and culture. So, you know, you're going to find, you know, what was the last podcast, what the next podcast is going to be. We also provide our readers with an opportunity to ask a question relevant to their particular organisation or just a general interest question. And we'll put that to the guest on the next show. Also, a couple of questions will be answered in the newsletter by a member of the team here at Marmalade Box. The newsletter will also include a book review. So we'll be looking at my extensive library and trying to highlight the books I think are worth purchasing and why they're worth purchasing. We'll also be providing some articles written by the team here and also articles that we found outside of Marmalade Box and sometimes outside of the security industry, which we think are of interest. The other way of staying in contact is to um, join the Marmalade Box LinkedIn group or to follow us upon Twitter and through our social media channels or through those social media channels, you know, we'll make sure that you're kept aware of when the new podcasts come out and also new blogs and articles. So it's been absolutely fantastic having you here on the show. I do hope that you've enjoyed it. I do hope you enjoyed sort of the general format of bringing in people from outside the security industry with experience or ideas or have conducted research into what I consider to be the universal challenges of awareness, behaviour and culture. So until the next time the podcast comes out and I get the opportunity to bring some new ideas to you, I hope you have a great month. I hope the run-up to Christmas isn't too stressful, and I hope you can join us next time around. Many thanks from the team here at Rethinking the Human Factor 